morning like to bring to order this, uh, this hearing uh, for the Veterans Affairs for the Vilcon VA subcommittee. Thank you all for attending. And today I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Secretary Robert A. McDonald, Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, for his first appearance before this subcommittee, uh, defending his uh, fiscal year 2016 budget request. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we know you have a, a lot of important material you want to present to us uh, today, and subcommittee members have a lot of questions for you, and I know competing hearings as well. So we'd appreciate you being willing uh, and uh, to keep your opening remarks to within uh, 10 minutes. I'll also uh, keep my opening remarks to a minimum. Uh, Secretary Bob, uh, you come before us as a, at, at a challenging time uh, for the VA. Uh, you're trying to recover from the waitlist scandal and implement uh, the complex new choice legislation, and you are trying to bring about a transformation of the agency to make it uh, more veteran uh, service uh, centric and certainly more customer friendly, and we appreciate those uh, very good and sincere efforts. Uh, you're also defending an enormous uh, budget increase in, in your discretionary budget of about $5.1 billion or a 7.8 percent increase, which is financed by offsets in the President's budget that, uh, that Congress, uh, frankly, is unlikely uh, to accept. Uh, I, ha I have to be frank with you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, uh, any, any increases are going to be extremely difficult to find under uh, the constraints uh, we have, and, and all departments are going to be affected under the, under the BCA, uh, the Budget Control Act, uh, with a, with a government-wide increase in the non-defense discretionary cap of $1.1 billion. Uh, we can't uh, make room for a, a $5.1 billion increase without taking a a machete to important programs and other subcommittees, and I suspect the, the chairman may agree with me on that point. Uh, we truly appreciate the complex mission you have at the VA and, and share your dedication uh, to making it work better. Uh, you have a lot of great employees out there, and uh, when, when I visit facilities, I'm always uh, ex extraordinarily impressed uh, by your, your medical team and all the allied health professionals. Uh, uh, the subcommittee uh, welcomes the opportunity to learn about your vision uh, for addressing uh, the VA's problems and reforming the agency so that we are sure we are uh, giving veterans uh, who want to use the VA the services they deserve. Uh, Mr. Bishop uh, is not here at the moment. He got tied up, uh, and uh, Mr. Farr has no comments. I'm going to quickly yield to the chairman and then to the ranking member of the full committee uh, for their opening statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations, by the way, on assuming this chair. Thank you. It, this is your first hearing? Uh, third hearing. Third hearing. Third. Well, okay, you're off to a good start. <laughs> uh, Anyway, congratulations to you and best wishes. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's, it's, we're glad to have you here. You bring some very impressive credentials to this uh, job from the private sector, uh, and we're looking for great things uh, from you, you and your staff. You've got your, you, you've got your headaches, you've got some problems, but I, I feel like you are the man for the job. And we congratulate you and welcome you to this uh, subcommittee for your first time. Uh, VA is charged with carrying out an essential responsibility of the U.S. government, and that's ensuring the health and well-being of our nation's vets who have selflessly served with dignity and honor. This charge brings with a, a host of challenges, providing our veterans with timely access to quality health care, ensuring that they receive appropriate compensation for disabilities, and fighting the persistent problems of veterans' homelessness and substance abuse. Just last summer, we were made aware of gross mismanagement and negligence on the part of this department. Veterans were kept on wait lists for months, awaiting health care services and treatments that they've been guaranteed by their government, and deservedly so. We can all agree that treating our veterans this way is unacceptable. And I commend you for your willingness to face these serious issues head on and the actions you've taken to right the ship. Among the changes you've made to the VA care model is the implementation of the Veterans Choice Program. Now, the Choice Program has offered thousands of veterans the opportunity to get off lengthy wait lists and seek treatment outside of the VA health care system. We're beginning to see progress on the wait lists, and veterans now have access to health care facilities closer to their homes. But even with this progress, more work remains. Uh, many veterans who should qualify for the CHOICE program have been denied access by the VA. These veterans either live more than 40 miles from a VA facility 
or must drive distances in excess of 40 miles to reach one due to ge geographical impediments. This department must take steps to ensure that the 40-mile rule and qualifying exceptions are applied evenly and in a timely manner. While we continue to hone and improve new programs such as Veterans Choice, it's critical that VA does not lose sight of important modernization initiatives that Congress has been promoting for years. One such initiative is digitizing VA's medical records. Mr. Secretary, uh, your budget includes $141 million for scanning files and medical records into digital format. Uh, which is the same as your fiscal 015 allocation. Uh, for 15, uh, the committee provided 40 million for three specific purposes, regional office staffing, digitized scanning, uh, and the centralized mail initiative. Yet, you've only allocated 10 million of that for scanning and centralized mail, uh, eliminating the need to locate and transfer paper records will streamline the, the claim and benefit process tremendously. Uh, we need a strong commitment from the department to make this a reality. I've visited one such center uh, and noticed the huge bundles in a file, a, a file may be this thick paper that's shipped all around the country trying to find its place. You're digitizing those records, which means you can electronically, instantaneously access that file without having to ship it from Burbank, California. Uh, so I, I really hope that we can see more of this. Another initiative Congress uh, has been emphasizing for some time now is the implementation of the electronic health record system that is interoperable with the DOD system. Uh, your budget requests $233 million for the VA electronic health record and sets aside $50 million of that for achieving the interoperable capacity. Uh, I appreciate your commitment to that initiative in the budget and the work you've done to stand up a framework that will allow your record system to work with DODs. And you've all heard me talk about this one instance uh, a few years ago. A vet from my district was injured by a bomb in Iraq. Uh, he, he lost one eye. The other eye was severely injured. Then he was discharged. And he comes, and, and this other eye begins to act up. So he goes to the VA hospital in Lexington. And VA declines to treat him. Uh, they, they were afraid to operate, not knowing what had happened in DOD hospital in Germany. And they couldn't get the records. And so he lost his other eye. Uh, simply because of the incapability of these two bureaucratic agencies to work together. That's going to stop, and you're making a really good start, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I continue to be concerned that until DOD awards a contract to produce its record and, and VA shows demonstrable progress uh, with a modernization of its record, uh, we can't be sure that this goal will be achieved in the near term. I can't emphasize uh, strong enough the importance of achieving interoperability with DOD's electronic health record system. If these two systems can't talk to each other, which I find incomprehensible, uh, we continue to run the risk of service members receiving inadequate care uh, and uh, undergoing uh, in inadvisable procedures. We need more than words on this critical issue. We need results. In fact, we're demanding results. We had a meeting uh, less than a year ago uh, with the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of VA, uh, and uh, we talked about this interminably. Both sides agreed to, to work it out, uh, but both sides are protecting their own turf. Uh, and so you'll find language in your appropriations that puts you under the gun on this, and we're going to do the same with the DOD, which we've been doing now for several years. 
And finally, uh, let me stress to you the seriousness of the problem of prescription drug abuse among our vets. We've all seen in the news the VA hospital in Toma, Wisconsin, that some are referring to as candy land. We now know that officials there have been over-prescribing opioids and possibly even contributing to the abuse of these drugs by our veterans. I'm pleased to see that the VA Office of Inspector General is investigating that case, and it's my hope that this investigation will lead to safer practices among those treating patients suffering from drug addiction. This committee is also interested to know what other actions the department is taking regarding these disturbing developments in Wisconsin, and I hope uh, you touch on that today. As part of your opioid safety initiative, it's important that the VA continue to pursue alternative remedies to prescription opioids and consider new technologies such as abuse deterrent drug formulations and tamper-resistant packaging. It's also critical that we continue to invest in tried and true models like veterans treatment courts. These courts, which require regular court appearances, drug testing, and treatment sessions, are integral to helping our veterans find a way forward uh, and out of addiction. This committee stands ready and willing to tackle these issues with you head on. And we hope that your department will remain a committed partner in the fight against prescription drugs, which the Center for Disease Control now says is a national epidemic. Uh, we look forward to learning how you plan to offer more timely and accessible health care to our vets and fulfill the promise that both Congress and the VA have made to serve them. Thank you. I, I have to go to another couple of hearings, and I'm going to miss a part of your testimony, which I regret. Mr. Chairman, thank, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to second your statement, particularly the issue of the interoperability between the uh, uh, VA and uh, DOD health records. It's uh, very important. It's uh, a priority, I think, for all of us. And at this time, I'd like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, Ms. Lowell. And uh, I would like Does this work? I think so. <laughs> I, too, would like to uh, thank my friend Chairman Den. Congratulations. And, unfortunately, Ranking Member Bishop, who's worked on these issues for a long time, I know, and worked with you, couldn't be here today. But this is a very important hearing, and I would like to welcome uh, Secretary McDonald and your assistants and all of our distinguished uh, guests this afternoon. As the subcommittee reviews the FY 2006 President's budget request, we have the tough mission and responsibility to ensure the funding for the Department of Veteran Affairs adequately addresses some very serious issues. The number of current veterans and those transitioning into the VA healthcare system is staggering. We must ensure that we have the right programs and services these men and women deserve for their service to our nation. We made certain promises to our veterans we are obligated to deliver. In your short time as the Secretary, your efforts have led to reductions in the claims backlog, accountability in your workforce, and initiation of several new programs to meet the growing demand and concern of all veterans. Specifically, I applaud the use of technology in the VA to further automate the claims submission and approval process which I understand has reduced the overall wait time by 138 days for a decision. And I just want to say, um, the chairman and I have been so frustrated. I think we had four hearings, a couple of public hearings, a couple of closed door hearings. It's beyond me, frankly that you can't get this done. And I know you're working towards that end. I won't put up pictures of all the old files that were kept in boxes, um, but it's such a disservice to men and women who serve our country with such distinction. Frankly, 
I still can't understand that the people who send our young men and women in harm's way, our government can't get this done, but I'm glad you're working on it, and I'm glad that there's progress. Um, it's amazing to me, in the private sector, you leave a job, you take a chip, you bring your health care information to the next employer, and we're still going through boxes. But um, thank you for the progress that's been made. And I look forward to the day, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Big Chairman, when we can hear mission accomplished and that it will be completed, because we know there's so much more work to be done. Um, at last count, by the way, the claims backlog was still around 214,000. And then there are more claims that are continuously added into the system. I hope you move the progress, uh, move this process forward expeditiously. I'm also very concerned about the amount of qualified medical personnel necessary to address the increasing number of veterans and serious issues like mental illness, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, and suicide prevention, especially in remote areas where there are limited and no VA facilities. I know we are in a fiscally uncertain environment. If the Budget Control Act remains, there may be some impact to certain services and programs, but veterans are a top priority. And while there is cause to celebrate some successes, we can and must do better. We are committed to working with you going forward. And I think it's important, Mr. Chairman, and I know the Chairman is struggling with the numbers and um, we don't know exactly the number that we're dealing with, but I think it's important when the numbers are released that we get an analysis of what those numbers will do to the whole process. So, Mr. Secretary, again, welcome. I, too, want to apologize because we have about four hearings today, uh, but I look forward to continue to talk with you, work with you, and I just want to say in closing and expedite that process. I'm glad to know that you have new facilities for records, but I still can't understand why it's taking so long. But thank you very much for the progress you've made, and thank you for your service. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Lowy, for your, for your comments at this time. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, your full statement uh, will be included in the official record. Uh, after you introduce uh, those who are accompanying uh, you today, please feel free to begin. and. Uh, Members are reminded that uh, we will be operating on a five-minute rule for questions. So with that, Mr. Se Secretary Bob, great to be Thank with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have with me today um, Under Secretary Hickey and Under Secretary Clancy, uh, who will join me, as well as uh, our CFO, uh, Helen Tierney, and Steph Warren, who runs our IT uh, operation. And hopefully we'll get a chance to get into detail on some of the issues that you all raised, like the electronic health record. Uh, Chairman Rogers, Chairman Dent, Ranking Member Lowy, uh, Ranking Member Bishop, members of the subcommittee, thanks for the opportunity to discuss VA's 2016 budget and 2017 advance appropriations request. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with uh, many of you prior to this hearing. We deeply appreciate Congress's and the President's steadfast support for veterans, their families, and survivors as well as the assistance of veteran service organizations. As VA emerges from one of the most serious crises the department has ever experienced, we have before us a critical opportunity to improve care for veterans and to build a more effective system. With your support, VA intends to take full advantage of this opportunity. Members of this committee and VSOs share my goal to make the VA a model agency with respect to customer experience, an example for other government agencies. With efficient and effective operations, we look to be comparable to the top private sector businesses. The cost of fulfilling our obligations to veterans grows over time because veterans' demands for services and benefits continue to increase as wars end. In 2014, 22% of Vietnam veterans were receiving service-connected disability benefits. That's four decades after the war ended. We expect the percentage will continue to increase. And it's worth remembering that today, almost 150 years after the Civil War, 
VA is still providing benefits to the child of a Civil War veteran. We still have troops in both Afghanistan and Iraq, yet in the last decade we've already seen dramatic increases for demand for benefits and care. From 1960 to 2000, the percentage of veterans receiving VA compensation was stable at about 8.5%. But in just 14 years, since 2001, the percentage has dramatically increased to 19%, more than double. Simultaneously, the number of claims and medical issues and claims have soared. In 2009, VBA completed almost 980,000 claims. In 2017, we project we'll complete over 1.4 million claims. That's a 47% increase. But there's been more dramatic growth in the number of medical issues in every single claim. 2.7 million in 2009 and a projected 5.9 million in 2017. That's a 115% increase over just eight years. These increases were accompanied by a dramatic rise in the average degree of veterans' disability compensation. For 45 years, from 1950 to 1995, the average degree of disability was 30%. Since 2000, the average degree of disability has risen to 47.7%. So while it's true that the total number of veterans is declining, the number of those seeking care and benefits is increasing dramatically. Fueled by more than a decade of war, Agent Orange-related claims, an unlimited claims appeal process, increased medical claims issues, far greater survival rates for those wounded on the battlefield, more sophisticated methods for identifying and treating veterans' medical issues, and importantly, demographic shifts, our veterans are aging, Veterans' demand for services and benefits exceeded VA's capacity to meet them. It's important that Congress and the American people understand why that is happening. The most important consideration is that Americans' veterans are aging and retiring. Just 40 years ago, only 2.2 million veterans were 65 years old or older. That's 7.5 percent of the population. In 2017, we expect 9.8 million veterans will be 65 years or older. That's 46% of all veterans. We now serve an older population with a greater demand for care, more chronic conditions, less able to afford private sector care. Currently, 11 million of the 22 million veterans in this country are registered, enrolled, or use at least one VA benefit or service. More are demanding VA services and care than ever before. Requirements for women veterans and mental health care have increased dramatically. Over 635,000 women veterans are now enrolled for health care, and over 400,000 actively use VA. That's double the number in the year 2000. Annual increases in women veterans seeking care are about 9%, and this trend will continue. Our Women Veteran Call Center now connects with over 100,000 women veterans per year. In 2014, over 1.4 million veterans with a mental health diagnosis entered VHA, and we had 19.6 million mental health outpatient encounters. That's increases of 64% and 72% respectively since only 2005. Since its inception in 2007, our Veterans Crisis Line has answered over 1.6 million calls and assisted in over 45,000 rescues. As veterans witness the positive changes VA is making and as the military downsizes, the number of veterans choosing VA services will continue to rise. It should, and they've earned it. We're listening hard to what veterans, Congress, employees, and veteran service organizations are telling us. What we hear drives us to an historic department-wide transformation, changing VA's culture and making veterans the center of everything we do. We call it My VA, and it entails many organizational reforms to better unify the department's efforts on behalf of veterans. My VA focuses on five objectives to revolutionize culture and reorient VA on veterans' outcomes rather than internal metrics. First, 
is improving the veteran experience so that every veteran has a seamless, integrated, and responsive customer service experience every single time. Second, improving the employee experience by eliminating barriers to customer service and focusing on our people and our culture so that we can better serve veterans. Third, improving our internal support services. Fourth, establishing a culture of continuous improvement to identify and correct problems faster and replicate solutions at all facilities. And last, enhancing strategic partnerships. The American people, many partners want to join us in this effort and we welcome them inside the tent. My VA reorganizing the department geographically is, is the first substantial step in uh, achieving this goal. In the past, VA had nine disjointed geographic organizational structures, one for each one of our nine lines of business. Our new unified organizational framework has one national structure, which is five regions. This aligns VA's disparate organizational boundaries into a single framework. This facilitates internal coordination and collaboration among our business lines, creates opportunities for local level integration, and promotes effective customer service. Veterans will see one VA rather than individual disconnected organizations. Last, my VA is also about ensuring sound stewardship of taxpayer dollars. We will integrate management improvement, uh, integrate management improvement systems such as Lean Six Sigma across operations to ensure we balance veteran-centric service with operational efficiency. But we need the help of Congress. VA cannot be a sound steward of the taxpayers' resources with the asset portfolio we carry. No business would carry such a portfolio, and veterans deserve better. It's time to close VA's old, substandard, and underutilized infrastructure. 900 VA facilities are over 90 years old, and more than 1,300 are over 70 years old. VA currently has 336 buildings that are vacant or less than 50% occupied. That's 10 and a half million square feet of excess uh, space, costing an estimated $24 million annually to maintain. These funds could be used to hire roughly 200 registered nurses for a year, pay for 144,000 primary care visits for veterans, or support 41,900 days of nursing home care for veterans in community living centers. We need your support to do the right thing. My VA reforms will take time, but over the long term, they will enable us to better provide veterans the services and benefits they've earned and that our nation has promised them. Our 2016 budget will allow us to continue transforming to meet the intent of my VA. It requests $168.8 billion, a $73.5 billion in discretionary funds, and $95.3 billion in mandatory funds for benefit programs. The discretionary request is an increase of $5.2 billion, or 7.5%, above the 2015 enacted level, providing resources to continue serving the growing number of veterans seeking care and benefits. The budget will increase access to medical care and benefits for veterans. It will address infrastructure challenges including major and minor construction, modernization and renovation. It will end the backlog of claims and it will end veteran homelessness in calendar year 2015. It will fund medical and prosthetics research and it will address important IT infrastructure and modernization. The resources required in the 2016 budget request are in addition to those Congress provided last year in the Veterans Choice Act. VA has implemented the act. We want to be successful and we'll be expanding our outreach and providing more information to veterans with a nationwide public service announcement which we'll share you the link so that you can see it. But we don't know at this time how many veterans will use the provisions of the act to seek non-VA care or how much that care will cost. There's a high degree of uncertainty as there is in any free marketplace with choice. Our current estimates of demand range from a low of about $4 billion for Choice Act to a high of about $13 billion over a three-year program. We'll need flexibility within our budget to ensure that we have the right resources at the right place at the right time to provide veterans the timely care they need 
regardless of where they choose to get that care. As an example of this flexibility, we are currently exploring options to review the 40-mile provision of the CHOICE Act to get more veterans the care that they want. I look forward to working with this committee, with other members of Congress, with veteran stakeholders on this critical issue. We meet today at a historically important time for VA and our nation. Today marks the 150th anniversary of President Lincoln's solemn promise to care for those who shall have borne the battle and for their families and their survivors. That's VA's primary mission, the noblest mission supporting the greatest clients of any agency in the country. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thanks again for your support for veterans, for working with us on these budget requests, and for making things better for all veterans. We look forward to your questions, sir. Thank you, Secretary. Um, Secretary, I have to begin with an issue I, I view as critical to the future of the VA, and we've discussed this, and I, and I know you, I know this view is shared with uh, members of the, of the subcommittee. The Choice Act, as you know, is uh, bifurcated, uh, reflecting the different views of the members of the House and Senate authorizing committees at the, at the time. On the one hand, the Choice Act uh, sets up a system for non-VA care to, uh, to be provided in situations where distance or wait time uh, prevent access to direct uh, VA health care. But it also finances the hiring of almost 10,000 uh, new VA medical staff and more than 200 uh, facility uh, leases and construction projects in an effort to strengthen capacity for direct VA care. Um, this is a rhetorical question, but is, is this bifurcated system sustainable in the long term? You know, can we afford to build up the VA system with its aging infrastructure at the same time as we develop uh, non-VA care alternatives? You know, I personally think that uh, non-VA care is a is a great and underutilized alternative, particularly uh, in the aftermath and uh, of the, what happened in Phoenix and, and elsewhere around the country. Uh, many veterans uh, have high-quality non-VA facilities in their neighborhoods, uh, but aren't able to use them and instead have to travel great distances, as you know, uh, for VA care. And let me be clear, I, I understand and support the need for the VA to provide specialty services in areas like uh, poly, polytrauma injury, PTSD, TBI, uh, Agent Orange, uh, uh, behavioral health and other areas, but uh, why shouldn't we rely on high quality private sector providers for more routine non service related care? I mean, that's really my question, uh, and uh, for you, Secretary, uh, given where I live and where many members live, uh, we have some world class facilities that this really cannot be utilized by many of our, uh, our nation's uh, veterans uh, who deserve the best. Mr. Chairman, we, we share your vision for a hybrid or integrated system of the future, an integrated system of VA care and non-VA care. Looking at it from the veteran's perspective, we want the veteran to get the care they need wherever uh, it's most convenient and that care is available. Uh, outside care is something the VA has been about for quite a while. In fact, over the last year, uh, our non-VA care appointments have increased about 48 percent. So that's a large increase. That's even before the Choice Act. With the Choice Act, we now have the ability, as you said, uh, if you're outside 40 miles, if you're beyond 30 days, of getting more people uh, access to outside care. It's very early days of the Choice Act. Uh, the last cards were mailed in January. We started in November. We set up the program in a period of months. Um, and so we're not yet certain how many veterans will take advantage of the CHOICE Act, and we'd like to continue opening the aperture of the CHOICE Act so me more veterans can take advantage of it. We're now getting in contact with all veterans to make sure they're aware of it, since many of the cards were sent out over the holidays and may have been lost. We're also uh, airing a public service ad, which is on our website, and we'd be happy to share that ad with you. Um, and we're doing everything we can to get more providers uh, into the system. But so far, we've not seen the full impact of the Choice Act, and we want to work with you on redefining it in order to get more people into it. Yeah, yeah, my observation is many veterans are aware of the program, but for whatever reasons are not eligible. Either they don't meet the 40-mile uh, requirement or the scheduling issue. But uh, as a quick follow-up, would the idea of a mix of an integrate or an integration of the VA and the private sectors, could that help us address the facility challenges that you so... Uh, clearly articulated in your testimony and that uh, would this help us uh, predict where the veterans will be geographically in order to build facilities years in advance? We think it will. Um, if you look over our recent past, uh, we've been leasing more facilities and creating more community-based outpatient clinics 
then we have the big, large uh, hospitals. That's a trend in the medical uh, industry, and uh, it's one that we think is appropriate in order to get care out to where the veterans actually live. And I would also mention, too, last week the group, the uh, Concerned Veterans uh, for America, released a report called uh, Fixing Veterans Health Care. Uh, the report prescribes a major restructuring of the VA health care. Uh, VA healthcare. Uh, among its proposals, this uh, bipartisan uh, task force recommends that future veterans be required to enter a new VA insurance <coughs> system uh, with varying levels of coverage. Uh, currently enrolled veterans would be able to continue using VA health facilities or shift to subsidized care uh, through private providers. It also calls for the closure of inefficient VA medical s uh, facilities similar uh, to your testimony. Mr. Secretary, I know you issued a statement rejecting the report saying that although there are, is an important role for non-VA uh, care in supplementing VA health care, re reform cannot be achieved by dismantling the VA system or preventing veterans from receiving VA care. I'm certainly not endorsing the report in its entirety, but I do think uh, it could uh, jumpstart a healthy debate about how to more efficiently and cost-effectively provide care to veterans. Uh, I'd be just curious for your thoughts. Well, as you, as you said in, in the statement that I issued, uh, we felt that many of the proposals uh, advocated contracting out this uh, sacred mission that we have for care for those who have borne the battle. Um, we think there's an important role for outside care, as I, as I have said. We think there will be a hybrid system, an integrated system in the future uh, to supplement VA's own care. But we don't think that diminishes or obscures the importance of VA's health care system. We think reforming VA health care can't be achieved by dismantling it and preventing it uh, or preventing veterans from receiving the specialized care and services uh, that can be provided by VA. Our goal continues to be to provide that care for veterans and we're happy to meet with uh, anyone to discuss any ideas. We, we believe every idea is on the table, but uh, we're going to look at it through the lens of what's best for veterans. Thank you. And that's, my time has expired. I'd like to recognize our very distinguished uh, ranking member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at this time, uh, Mr. Farr has a, uh, he's ranking member on the Agriculture Subcommittee and he has a hearing that he needs to be in at, uh, presently. So I'm going to yield okay. to him well, and allow him okay. to go first. Thank you very much for Sorry. yielding, uh, Mr. Bishop, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Secretary, for coming here and thank you for your service, West Point graduate. And, uh, you know, the, the biggest uh, sort of statement made often in Congress is, why don't we run government like a business? I don't think anybody's come before this committee that's had more business background than you have. Uh, CEO and president of um, Procter & Gamble, awarded the best company for developing uh, leader talent. This goes on and on. And <laughs> I think your training in the military in the 82nd Airborne is going to be very helpful because I notice you have a specialty in training in jungle warfare. And coming before Congress, which has just told you that uh, despite uh, this incredible testimony with probably more reform um, suggestions in it than any opening statement I've ever heard from a secretary in any department, uh, that you're not going to be, you've been heard from the chair that because of our resistance to uh, adequately fund government, that you're not going to get the money you're asking for. And I hope, Mr. Chairman, when we finally get these numbers, and we, we're taking the veteran's budget, cutting, squeezing, and trimming it, that we can bring the secretary back and have a, a d real discussion, transparency, on what those cuts are going to uh, mean. I mean, what, what, what's going to happen? Because you put in here how we can fix things that are broken, but you also indicate that you're going to need money to do that, that it can't all be done just by savings. I mean, the idea, I think your idea of sort of a BRAC for, for veterans' uh, facilities may be, may be worth going through and, and a lot more. And I want to tell you that I appreciate you going out and seeing cemeteries as, as you have. Uh, this next uh, week from Friday, I'm dedicating a cemetery, the first state cemetery combination uh, in your department was very helpful in that, and I want you to thank those people that worked in that. Um, my, you in, indicated that one of the, uh, the, to the chairman's question about um, sort of more combined professional network, private sector, that you're looking for more providers for the system. Well, I'm very concerned that because of PTSD and everything, what I find in California, and I know, know that uh, uh, Congressman Barbara Lee is uh, very concerned about this too, representing one of the centers for VA in Oakland, 
is that I think, and you and I talked about the office, is we can't find marriage and family therapists uh, to work for the VA because the VA has this ruling, and I really want you to go back and find out what initiated that ruling. It sounded more like an earmark to me than anything else, that we can't hire uh, marriage and family therapists uh, in the VA unless they have graduated from uh, accredited institutions that have a accredited curriculum. Now, California, you know, has 95% of the certified marriage and family therapists who cannot qualify to work for the VA. They went to Stanford. They went to Berkeley. I mean, this is nuts. And I, and I, 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 I can't believe that, uh, that we can't take steps to correct that. Uh, we're opening the first jointly designed DOD VA clinic in, in the, on the Monterey Peninsula uh, next year. Uh, you're, you're having a heck of a problem trying to get uh, hire a psychiatrist to come to the area. It's a very expensive area. You're having even a harder time getting marriage and family counselors, and a lot of them in the community would love to go work for VA. So I hope that you will check this thing of what steps the VA is taking to providing and maintaining a significant number of mental health practitioners. And, um, and when, when can you accept the credentialing of California marriage and family uh, therapists as uh, part of that professional core that you want to uh, increase? Let me also uh, uh, say that the um, the backlog on the Board of Appeals, um, uh, if, if that, ba the amount of money you're committing to that, if that's going to be cut in these reductions that the chair talked about, um, by the way, he's not the only chair, every chair of every appropriations committee is giving the warning to secretaries. See, what we do here is we have, we have all these nice hearings on what the presidents propose. And then we get the numbers from the budget committee, and then we have, and then we go behind closed doors and, and, and cut the hell out of everything, and then we adopt it without any public transparency. And uh, I hope that this year we'll change that, and that we have subsequent hearings once we get the numbers. Is saying, okay, this is what you asked for. This is all you're going to get. What are the consequences? Because that's what we're supposed to relay to our constituency. So uh, if you could look into the, to the marriage and family counseling and, and the backlog on the Board of Appeals. Um, and lastly, let me just say that the, law, the local law enforcement officers are coming to me and they say that the VA needs to assist local law enforcement officers in VSOs in dealing with suicidal veterans who, uh, and they want to know who in the local law enforcement, who should they contact to uh, have these people that they know from the local community are in harm's way uh, for others and themselves, and yet there's, there's no kind of crisis core specialist in the VA that can go out with law enforcement and, and intervene in these uh, crises with, with, with veterans who are, uh, you know, in, in real problems, and some of them get killed because of their actions, and uh, I'd like to see if we can develop that expertise. Thank you. I want to respond quickly, Mr. Secretary? Yes, sir. Um, first of all, relative to um, our employment initiative, we are recruiting. Um, this week I was at uh, the University of Delaware um, School of Nursing, and it was my 13th uh, medical school trying to recruit people, so we do desperately need people. We talked about the um, the, the issue in California, and I asked uh, Dr. Clancy to do a deep dive on that, maybe let her report on that. So um, thank you, Secretary. Uh, Congressman, we have a group taking a very hard look at this issue again. You have the facts exactly right in terms of our initial interest in hiring marriage and family therapists who had graduated from an accredited program. Uh, by a commission with a very long name because we wanted to make sure that we had people with the best skills to uh, meet the needs of veterans, which can be fairly complex. My understanding is that some of the newer programs have actually sought that accreditation, but we would be happy to follow up with you uh, in terms of looking at are there other opportunities for us to bring this cadre of folks in to help veterans. 
Uh, relative to the uh, police organizations, we do have a, a national police organization well trained uh, to deal with uh, veterans, uh, particularly those with post traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury. Uh, it's their role to reach out to the community, connect with the community, and make sure the local community is, um, is uh, aligned. What they need is when the crisis occurs, it's incident command. Uh, they need to have somebody they can call yes. who knows the veterans because local law enforcement can't always talk them out of a situation like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Uh, we'll follow up on that. We are working very hard to strengthen our, um, our security organization, particularly in light of uh, what happened in El Paso, and this will be one of the things we build into it. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to re re uh, recognize Mr. Jolly of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here this morning. I've got a couple uh, quick questions specifically on appropriations matters. Uh, you and I spoke about the backlog and benefits. It's a priority of mine, and I think the next story after the VHA is going to be the VBA uh, if we don't solve the backlog. Your budget requests $85 million for 770 new FTEs, as well as $230 million additional for IT. So I, 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 uh, a additional request of 85 million for 770. Do you believe that will have a demonstrable impact on clearing the backlog, or are we just keeping up as best we can? I think it'll have a demonstrable impact. And um, as as we talked, the number of claims is going up, the number of issues per claim is going up. We've committed to ending the backlog by 2015 and then keeping it down. I would draw your attention to the pictures in my written testimony of the Winston-Salem uh, VBA office, where on one, in one picture you see all the files that Chairman Rogers was talking about. The other picture you see no files uh, because everything's been digitized. We've done all we can with digitization, with mandatory overtime. Now we need more people. And ending the backlog is defined how? What's the number of days? Or 125 days, Allison. Okay. So I just wanted to let you know, Congressman, that actually uh, we are well on target to end the disability rating claims backlog, 125 days. Um, we are right now, we've reduced that backlog from 611,000 down to the 214,000, almost 400,000 that are no longer in backlog. Um, we also uh, have at the same time increased our quality uh, of our claims, well over 90% at the medical issue level and 96 percent, uh, I mean 90 percent at the claim level, 96 percent at the medical issue level. Uh, we will hit that, but what we, your question is about the current budget. The current budget is focused on the appeals, non-rating, and fiduciary requirements. Those are all direct results of doing 1.32 million sure. claims. No, I understand, I, and, and I appreciate your attention to this. Fr frankly, it's something that I would support that increase if you, if if you believe that that does solve this, this is an issue of significant concern. Uh, very quickly on the OIG budget, what is the increase in the OIG budget? The increase that was in West. in the but the, the the real request uh, we've had subsequent conversations with the OIG uh, is 15 million dollars, and we support that request. Right now, we have a number of investigations. What percentage is that? Do you know? Uh, I don't know exactly. I mean, if overall it's a 7.5 percent for the department, is OIG comparative to that? Is it less? We'll, we'll do the math okay. and, and get back I to you. But it's, it's 15 million dollars. We have a lot of investigations going on. We need to get through them and get get them over with. Sure. Uh, another appropriations question: FY14, there was a, a request for the department to pursue community mental health partnerships uh, to uh, use excess capacity and major metro areas to provide non-VA mental health services. Has there been any movement on that? Uh, there's been significant movement. In fact, um, I'll let Carolyn talk, but I, I wanted to mention something you and I had talked about earlier, strategic partnerships, uh, home base in Boston where I visited, uh, funded by the Boston Red Sox, uh, serving veterans with TBI, with PST. Uh, we're very supportive of the activity. We want to create more of those strategic partnerships. So we do uh, actually actively partner with a number of uh, practitioners in the private sector to help serve the needs of veterans. And the good news is we just learned that we have figured out how to make sure that they can have easy access to our continuing education materials rather than our kind of shipping them in paper. Now they can actually get online directly and get their continuing education credits, which I think only strengthens that. 
So the 14 bill directed a demonstration project. Is there anything, ha, have you actually defined a demonstration project in this where you're just using non-VA providers in mental health care when you need it? Um, I think that we've done some of both, but I'm gonna have to follow up with you on that. And then one last thing, just for the record, and you and I spoke about this, I appreciate your attention to it, but I do want it to be on the record. Uh, we have had several cases of veterans, veteran beneficiaries who have been notified falsely of their, de their own death. Uh, I understand this from the VA's perspective that results from Social Security Administration sending over a notice. Uh, we know it's disruptive to the veteran. Uh, the VA has always resolved it, uh, but it is a disruption that takes a month or two to solve. So uh, I would appreciate your continued attention. To we, that. we actually talked this morning after our discussion, and we're, we're going to go dig into the Social Security Administration and find out what's going on, because we, we have to take responsibility for that. Sure. The veterans are ours. And it sounds funny, but obviously to the veteran no, and beneficiary, it is not. It's, it's devastating. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Jolly. That reminds me of the old George Bernard Shaw statement that the rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Uh, certainly, we certainly don't want that to happen. Uh, Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary, Ms. Clancy, um, and the other panel members. Um, your FY16 budget request includes $140.8 million for the Veterans Claim Intake Program. Uh, which is a continuation of a scanning program that began scanning uh, in September of 2012. I have a couple of questions about this. First, uh, how many scanning contracts uh, does the VA have uh, for that program? And second, how many documents are scanned per month and what happens to the documents after they're scanned? And then once the document has been scanned, uh, how long does it take to get the completed package to a claims processor? Let me let Allison answer that, but I just want to say that the scanning process is absolutely essential. It allows us to digitize the claim, which allows us to have a national workflow. We can move those uh, claims anywhere in the country that has time and effort to get it done. It's one of the things that's led to the reduction in the backlog. Allison? Uh, so, Ranking Member, uh, first of all, uh, one contract. Um, it's a uh, performance-based contract, so we have two large uh, organizations, that, large companies that participate in it, and you're rewarded for doing better, so there's a performance competition base there. Uh, four sites, one of which is in Noonan, Georgia, another in Kentucky, a third in Wisconsin, and a fourth in Iowa. Um, they, we have uh, successfully scanned more than 1.3 uh, uh, billion images since the start at 99% quality, and that has effectively allowed us to reduce our paper inventory down to a remaining 25,000 claims out of the 477,000 that are in the inventory. So we are 95% paperless right now, and we do uh, all of our claims works now in the digital environment, minus those 25,000 we're trying to get out. Um, uh, the companies have done a very good job of building quality assurance into this. We've mandated. Uh, that for the contract, they have four to five layers of quality assurance to ensure the reliability. But to the point of what happens to the paper, we are paying a lot of money for the contractors to hold the paper while we're waiting on the DOD decision because these are DOD records. We are working actively with DOD through the Benefits Executive Committee uh, to make that decision. We will be involving our veteran service organizations in that final decision on what is the proper disposition of those records. I will tell you that I have today, sitting in regional offices across the country, half a million cubic feet of paper we are no longer using or touching. We are waiting on the simple disposition decision on what to do with those paper records because we are doing most of our business through the electronic digital environment. In fact, more than a million claims and more than two million rating decisions. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so when do you think that decision will come? Uh, so, Congressman, I'm going to try to talk a little quieter. I apologize. My good Irish voice carries aloud. Um, uh, so we are working literally right now on that decision with DOD. They are newly incentivized to move faster on this issue because they are now storing paper from what they are scanning uh, in their central cells um, for the services to bring us the records across from Hames. So we are literally right now, as we're working, I suspect sometime this year we will have a final decision. 
when we do, that will, as I expect, require resources to move us into that environment of proper disposition of those records, and that is not in the current budget right now. All right. Uh, I uh, recently read that VISTA is uh, no longer in contention to be used by DOD for the electronic health records, uh, which is not surprising because it was clear that DOD uh, historically has wanted nothing to do with VISTA. Uh, what steps are being taken to make sure that whatever system that DOD chooses, uh, VISTA will be able to share information with it? Uh, I know that this is a lot before your time, Mr. Secretary, but uh, as you know, your department and DOD were directed to develop an electronic health record system, and uh, can you tell us why it's been so difficult to achieve? <clears throat> Ranking Member Bishop, I, I, I've said many times since I came in this job that we shouldn't punish veterans or service members by having boundaries between organizations that get in the way of their care. Um, so we take it very seriously that we've got to <laughs> integrate with DOD on the electronic health record. It's one of the first things I looked at. And uh, I've been to our sites, uh, San Antonio, for example, where we run a hospital with DOD and we have VA and DOD doctors looking at the same uh, medical information on the screen. So I'd like uh, Steph Warren, if I could, to do a little bit of a deep dive on, uh, on VISTA uh, to bring the committee up to speed. And we would be happy to come over and do um, demonstrations for you in your office for your staff and you. So to, to hit your point about interoperability, Top's question was with whatever system DOD purchases uh, is interoperability guaranteed. <coughs> DOD, no matter what system is bought, the, the requirement to maintain the interoperability that we've accomplished will continue. So we, we've talked in prior hearings about a tool called Janus, uh, which today allows us to look at the DOD record and the VA record in the same screen simultaneously. So that interoperability, the ability to see the record in the care setting is happening today. Um, uh, may I just, just interrupt you for a second? Didn't, didn't we in Congress, both the authorizers and the appropriators, uh, direct DOD and VA to use a one system as opposed to um, two systems? So, so the, the interoperability in terms <coughs> of the information sharing and viewing. We, we are doing that using the same services. Um, both of the departments approximately two years ago, and, and I believe we had a joint hearing. Uh, I think it was the largest hearing I'd ever been in with 50 plus members. We talked through how the mission differences between VA and DOD drove DOD to a decision in terms of buying a, uh, an end-to-end -end system with a logistics tail and that we would continue to work with uh, the VISA system, which is that veteran-centered solution, and keep evolving it forward. It's my understanding, though, that, that, that the system that you're using uh, prohibits the manipulation of the data. So basically, it's viewing only. So it, it's not really interoperable because, uh, you know, a doctor at VA can't uh, manipulate the, the information there, uh, nor can the, you know, so that, that's not very, very helpful in what we're trying to get to. And we really instructed uh, both DOD and VA to have one seamless system. And of course, uh, this was before the Secretary's uh, tenure, um, both uh, departments seemed to have backed off from that and just said, well, we want inter interoperability. But uh, it's, just makes no sense to me, and I continue to, 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 to really labor over the question of why it is that uh, DOD and VA want to have stovepipe systems that, in this instance, will just allow them to, to, to view it. So, not Frank, remember the, the if I could, the, the viewer is to show the ability to <coughs> view the data it is the first step. Uh, there, there's a key point that, that uh, we need to make sure we lay out there. If you look at on the DOD side with respect to care, the majority of their care takes place outside of their health care delivery system also. It will also take care, be, will be given outside of whatever their new system is. On the VA side, uh, with the third party care we've been giving as well as what the Choice Act will be doing, a large amount of our care will also be outside of that healthcare system. Our biggest challenge is how do you move the data between different systems? How do you present it up in a care setting? 
Janus shows that you can do it. The data gets translated so it is the same. All, all Janus did was to show that you could do it, yes, in a read-only. Uh, right now, the, the <coughs> Enterprise Health Management Program, which is deployed in San Diego, moves it to the next step, which is the ability to go in why, and why couldn't, why couldn't Why couldn't both departments have one system and uh, if you have outside care, have the outside providers uh, certified to utilize and to enter that system uh, with uh, secured access uh, so that only people who are authorized can enter the system. But if you have one system, everybody's got access. It's, so, it's simple. Sir, I, I wish it was that simple. <coughs> when, we, when we talk about health care delivery, the, the viewer is how the clinician interacts with the data. But the systems we're talking about are more than just the viewing of the data. It is the pharmacy system, it is the immunization system, it is all of the other things. I understand that. that. A medical center. I, I understand that. So buying one big system that does all of that stuff, if you go look at the National Health Service in the UK, they showed that one system could not do all of that stuff across all of those different places. And so what's key is how do you make sure the data moves between the systems not just VA and DOD, but <coughs> third-party providers in a way that clinical care can take place. And I believe that's the path we're on, and we've been able to show that we can accomplish it. Uh, but glad to come and, and sit down more, uh, walk you through, and show you how those systems are working together and how the data is flowing, sir. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just not convinced that uh, the technology can't be uh, uh, fashioned uh, to accomplish that. But uh, my time is, is up, and I'll, I'll come back uh, a little later. Thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member, and I'm sure there will be more questions on that uh, particular topic. Uh, Mr. Rooney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate, uh, Mr. Secretary, our, our visit yesterday, and, and I appreciate sort of the uh, spirit of, of the, the other um, testimony that we've heard. You know, it's, it's okay if you speak too loud, especially with issues that uh, frustrate not only members of this committee, but I'm sure your uh, agency, uh, as well as the veterans and, and, the, and the people that we serve, certainly South Central Florida has its share of, of retirees and veterans. Um, one of the things that I was, I was most impressed with, Mr. Secretary, when we visited was the kind of um, background that you have and in, in the business acumen that you bring to the table. And I think that, you know, when people kind of read your resume and, and, and get to know you, um, not, to, not to say that previous secretaries haven't uh, been able to uh, accomplish what they set out to do, but the fact of the matter is, is we're still talking about a lot of the same things that we've <laughs> been talking about since I got to Congress six years ago, and, and uh, you know, as Mr. as Mr. Bishop alludes to, one of the big frustrations for me as a, as a veteran myself is kind of when you join the Army, as you know, and things are kind of prescribed for you and you're sort of told where to stand, what to say, and what to do. Um, and then when you get out of the Army and you kind of hear this, well, you know, the, the, the orders for the prescriptions aren't exactly the same or we're just getting around to our computer systems being able to communicate and understand each other. and that's the kind of thing that when you join the Army or you join one of the other branches, you sort of assume are already taken care of. And when you find out that, that you're, they're not, I think that that's the most frustrating thing. So my, que my question revolves around your background and, and some of the things that, and the frustrations that we've heard. You don't have a lot of time in, in this job, I, I assume. And what time you have here with being a former CEO of a major company, what do you honestly think that you're going to be able to accomplish for veterans? Um, and, and, and what kind of innovation, you know, I have a question all drafted out here for me about, you know, VSOs in our local counties that want to be able to be more active in screening and things like that at, at, the, at the county level. Maybe that's part of it. And you talked yesterday about, um, you know, consolidation of some of the people that are doing the, the same job. Um, and, and that's all great. But I think that you as a spokesman getting out there and showing the kind of frustration that we've heard, the American people will respond to me like, I like that guy. I agree with him. Uh, he's a CEO. He's not, you know, no, no disrespect again to formal, former secretaries. But 
what can you, what, what's been your biggest frustration? What kind of innovation do you think you'll be able to bring to the table? So six years from now, this committee isn't still talking about these same things like prescription orders aren't marrying up and computers aren't talking to each other. So if you, if you could talk to that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, first of all, uh, Congressman Rooney, thank you for the question and thank you for your service. Um, everything we've put together, we're, we're not looking at as a, as a time-bound exercise. But I would hope that everything we've talked to you about in terms of my VA, the reorganization we're talking about, I think we can certainly get done uh, over the next couple of years. My biggest frustration uh, from the very beginning was the lack of focus on the veteran. It was uh, a sense that we were an organization, as I went around, and I've been to over 100 sites now of VA, employees were telling me they, they felt like they were prisoners of a system that they couldn't change. The single message I'm giving employees every time I go somewhere and I do a town hall meeting is, no, this is your VA too and you can change it. I've embraced union leadership. I've 65 percent of our employees are union members. Um, this, this leadership team, this group of employees is going to change the VA, is going to put the veteran at the center of everything we do. My first national press conference, which I think was in uh, September, I gave out my cell phone number uh, nationally. It's available on the Internet. Um, and uh, I'd like members of Congress to do the same. And uh, I get calls every single day from veterans. And I like that because I'm able to figure out what's going on. We stood up a team of people to help me with it, but I like to answer the phone. I did that deliberately because I wanted to demonstrate to everybody during a time of crisis, it's normal organization dynamic and normal human dynamic that people turn inward and in a sense become more bureaucratic and worry about their own survival. What we need to do is turn outward, care about veterans, embrace veterans, and I see those changes happening right now. I hear it on my phone at night when I am able to answer the calls and I get a lot of letters and we respond to every single one of them. That's a big change. So, uh, Congressman, first thing I'll ask you as a veteran, if you have your e-benefits account, and if you don't, I would like to come over and help you get it. But I, you don't need me to, because we have built a complete online um, capability from a veteran at 2 o'clock in the morning. If you're reading a long bill and you decide you want to file a claim, you can go online. You can file your claim online. You can upload your own medical uh, evidence online in your three-in-one computer, turn it into a PDF, and give it to us. Um, you can find out the status of your claim online, uh, and it all goes now into the VBMS system where the digitization has occurred that we spoke about earlier, and the decisions can be projected to you when they come out online. All of that has been built in the last three or four years while we have been transforming VBA while flying the airplane while we were building it. For, sorry, former airmen as well, so I'm going to use that analogy. Um, so we have fundamentally changed VBA already, but we're not done yet. Uh, there are a lot of things in this, in this budget that we need to fundamentally change three other parts of a benefit allowance to a veteran. And I will tell you straight up, uh, appeals. Appeals are wired in law worse than tax code. There are two opportunities for you to help us with appeals. One is change the law, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of appetite for it but I've submitted all the legislative proposals. And the second is you've got to give me a whole lot more people to do that work. I've got no other way to do that better. Law or people, authorizers or appropriators, I don't care. What I care about is veterans getting a better answer. Thank you. And I just want to point out for the record, I made that particular quote about the rumors of my death being greatly exaggerated, I attribute it to George Bernard Shaw. I believe it was Mark Twain. So with that, I recognize Mr. P Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, I want to welcome you and your colleagues to the uh, committee. We uh, appreciate the energy and determination you've brought to the VA in a short period of time and uh, appreciate the background you bring to this, the business background, the military background, and I should say also the educational background because I'm uh, well aware of the uh, value you've rendered to uh, Duke University's Fuqua School of Business as one of their major um, advisors. Um, a lot of hand-wringing today, as there always is, about the constraints we're operating under. Uh, maybe we need to remind ourselves that these are, uh, these are not uh, written in stone. They are 
the results of very explicit uh, politi political failings. Um, the Budget Control Act still hovers over us and, and haunts the work of this uh, subcommittee uh, with its centerpiece, uh, sequestration. Uh, sequestration, however, is self-inflicted damage. It was not supposed to occur. It's the result of a very specific failure to address the main drivers of the deficit, tax expenditures and entitlement spending. This body, having failed to address those, has fallen back again and again on appropriated uh, spending. So we need to do more than just decry this. Uh, we need to change it. We need to take specific steps to overcome it. That really would mean a comprehensive budget deal that deals with the main drivers of the deficit. But if we can't get that, we at least need another year-long budget deal, a la Ryan Murray, to get us off of sequestration and with some numbers we can work with here. And this applies, of course, to uh, this subcommittee and, and, and probably even more to other uh, subcommittees. Uh, so I, the, the, the resource constraints are, are, are serious here, and, and yet a lot of the problems that you've identified call for uh, additional resources, particularly personnel resources, and that's what I want to ask you about uh, very specifically. We're all aware of the um, unacceptable wait times for primary care mental health uh, patients at various facilities in my district around the country. We, we know that this is linked in part this is what I want to ask you to assess, a linked in part to a lack of primary and mental health care providers in the system, particularly at more rural locations. So I want, I want to give you a chance to address that problem uh, system-wide. Is the lack of uh, manpower and woman power a primary obstacle to achieving uh, acceptable wait times and, and, um, and adequate care in, in general? Uh, I know you visited a lot of medical schools, including Duke University, I'd say. Glad you came there. You spoke to medical students about coming to work for the VA. How did you do? How are you doing? Um, what, um, what can you do to recruit the best and brightest young people in the medical field? Uh, where are the most serious shortages? What, what specialties or what areas of, of, of practice? And then how much is this a matter of compensation? Uh, what else is, 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 is going on here? What is your assessment, having looked at this, I know very carefully, what's it going to take uh, besides an adequate appropriation to uh, solve the problem? Thank you, Congressman Price. Uh, great questions. Um, staffing is a big issue for us. Um, roughly, we're, we're short about 4,000 physicians uh, and about 10,000 nurses. Uh, I've been to roughly over a dozen uh, medical schools Duke University was the first uh, medical school I visited, uh, and we're competing against uh, some of the for-profit systems in the country to attract the best and brightest doctors and nurses we can find. One of the first things I did as secretary was to raise the salary bands uh, of our doctors to, in order to pay them competitively. Um, that has, has helped our recruiting effort, and if I look over the last nine months, uh, we've hired roughly uh, 900 doctors, uh, net new. So in other words, we've had some leave. Our retention rate is very good. We've had some leave, but we've got roughly 900 more new doctors, and uh, that's good. We've hired over 1,000 uh, nurses. So that's been very helpful. But while the, getting the providers is helpful and paying them competitively is helpful, the other thing I'm, I'm up against is, um, is just, in a sense, the aura that exists in this country that VA is somehow a terrible place to work. And um, I'm pleased that the, the chairman and ranking members of our two committees, House and uh, Senate Veterans Affairs Committees, have come to VA. We've done uh, town hall meetings, national town hall meetings, so that the members of the committee could express themselves to the employees about how much they respect what they're doing and how important it is. The other barrier we face is the infrastructure. Um, we have 11.5% roughly female uh, veterans right now. It's going to grow to 20%. And our buildings are over 50 years old. Uh, they were built at a time when you had one gender a bathroom, where you, had, where you didn't have space for women's clinics. And one of the things we know about women veterans is they prefer to enter the building and exit the building in a different place. Uh, than the men. So we're in the process of trying to retrofit those, but that's why our construction budget is so, uh, is so important. 
One last example, and I'll end, is part of the problem in Phoenix that we talked about was providers, was the doctors and nurses. When I went there, we needed a thousand new people the day I was there. That was right after I was confirmed. But one of the problems that didn't get much publicity is we only had one clinical room for each doctor. And the average doctor has three clinical rooms, one where the patient's getting ready, one where the patient's being examined, one where the patient's getting ready to leave. So this is a fundamental issue. Uh, last point is I talk a lot about VA being the canary in the coal mine for American medicine. Our shortage of primary care physicians, our shortage of mental health professionals is a national shortage. And uh, that's why I go to the medical schools is to try to increase the throughput and increase the residencies so we can get a greater, a greater number of uh, mental health professionals and family care physicians. Yes. Uh, just a couple of other points because I know that you expressed a particular interest in rural health care. Uh, one of the areas I think where we're doing very well is in virtual care, particularly telemental health. Uh, which frankly makes it very much, much easier for some veterans who don't always find any complex facility all that easy to navigate and so forth. Uh, we're doing enough of it that we're starting to talk now about whether we actually need to train and hire people who are virtualists. Uh, there are companies that do this now. We could actually have an internal group that does that. Um, the other part, and I just want to thank uh, you and your colleagues for, is the uh, loan reduction program. We now have for the first time the uh, opportunity to pay the lenders back directly. What we've been doing before, if you think about how indebted many of these students emerge from uh, postgraduate training with, um, is when they paid, then we reimbursed. So if they fell behind, they didn't get the reimbursement. You can see where this gets into a kind of uh, vicious cycle. Now we can pay the lender back. So not only can we offer that to new people coming in, we can actually help some of our own, re it's both a recruitment and a retention tool, which I think is going to be uh, phenomenal. And ultimately, the mission is what really attracts people. You asked, though, what's the, mo the hardest? I would say primary care and mental health. Uh, both, as you probably are aware, are not incredibly well-paid uh, specialty areas. Um, both were in stiff competition with the private sector. You probably saw the report yesterday from the Association of American Medical Colleges, I think, saying we're short 90,000 physicians or something along those lines. Um, but that's what we're working at. The point about space is we actually do have a tool now to assess productivity so that in addition to broad messages about we need space people and so forth, we can actually help facilities figure out what's the rate limiter for them. Is it really more the space, the people, and so forth? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here. And um, I, too, want to echo the sentiments of my colleague that um, we appreciate the time that you've taken to meet with us prior to today's hearing. So, um, But I think a couple of the points that were discussed are worth mentioning again for the benefit of those that are in this hearing room today and, and for the American people and for the constituents in Alabama, too, who um, have suffered, these veterans have suffered horribly at the hands of bad actors. Um, Mr. Chairman, the Central Alabama VA health system is one of the worst in the country. Um, we had one of the first directors actually removed uh, under the new law that we passed because uh, his behavior and the decisions that he made in the environment in which he created um, was so um, disastrous and horrible uh, that he was actually removed and you of course know all of this and you're keenly aware of the situation and I know um, just thank Sloan Gibson Deputy Secretary who has had his um, you know his presence uh, in Alabama uh, consistently working with my staff to provide us updates um, as I told you Mr. Secretary uh, last evening that I'm looking forward to the day when I can stand with you behind the podium um, and celebrate the successes of the VA, but we're not there, and you know that. Um, and there's still a real distrust because the numbers that we were presented uh, as it relates to access to care um, were so um, false and wrong. And um, so, so we'll continue to work with you on that. I do think, um, as you mentioned, um, that you're dealing with a huge bureaucracy and 
and feeling your way through it, that there are some real commonsensical themes here that you've heard from the chairman and, and others throughout this as it relates to um, access to care. And we know the VA does a lot more than just that, but for right now, we have a lot of sick veterans that need access to care. And for me, in light of what took place um, in Southeast Alabama, um, I really want the focus to be down there on how do we get more veterans access to good quality care in a timely fashion. And uh, both with choice, um, the choice cards and uh, with PC3, patient-centered community care, which is a huge priority to me. We have wonderful medical facilities in Southeast Alabama where um, these veterans could access care immediately rather than having to go to Atlanta or some other facility. Um, so I wanna continue to be helpful in any way that I can uh, to push these programs, uh, that this committee could be helpful in ensuring that we um, allow veterans to have access to um, outside providers. Um, and then the balance between, as you mentioned with the facilities, we have all these aging facilities that need, um, how do we um, figure out a way to find the cost savings um, in bricks and mortars and use that money again for, for our veterans to access care. So I know these are all priorities of yours because I've heard you say that. Um, the one thing that I did want you to elaborate on um, is the, the authority to reallocate the choice funding. Um, as you have stated that you've been mischaracterized on what your um, ideas are, but it is, uh, the one thing I'm concerned about is, is the, you know, Congress gave you 15 billion for that, and you were saying that there's uncertainty right now in knowing how much access um, veterans, or how, how many veterans will utilize uh, the CHOICE program. Um, so if we could just talk about that in a little bit more detail, because I, I really think that this is a huge part of the solution to getting towards this hybrid system that would allow our veterans to, to have good quality health care. I was, uh, one of my surprises when I came back to government was the inflexibility of being able to serve customers. Uh, I'm used to the private sector. I'm used to if a customer wants to buy Tide, we have Tide for them. If they want to buy Dash or whatever, we have Dash for them. Um, the inflexibility of moving money from one light item to the other, despite the fact that the consumer, the veteran, has a choice, doesn't make much sense to me. It's analogous to having two checking accounts at home. One is for gasoline, one is for food, and uh, you can't move money between the two. The price of gasoline falls in half, and you're hungry, you want to buy food, but you can't do that. Because of the choice program, we've given the veterans a choice. You, the Congress, have defined by law the benefits that veterans get. I'm trying to execute and provide those benefits, but yet you control both the benefits they get and you control the money I have to spend to deliver those benefits. I'm kind of a prisoner of, of the system. All I was saying uh, with the request for flexibility was, and I'm happy to come back with you at the appropriate time, as these programs, as we begin to integrate these programs with the only intention of serving veterans, let's make sure we have a discussion that we have the money in the right place and that we have enough money in the right place that we can provide the veterans the care that the laws that we've passed said they deserve. I just want to make sure we have that conversation. I because I can't predict the free market with 100% certainty. Sure, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. One, one quick little thing about the 40-mile rule. Um, I'm concerned that this has been, um, the definition is not clear about driving or as the crow flies. What do we need to do to modify language so that we ensure that it truly is for those that are 40 miles away instead of interstate highway versus, you know, direct When, when the law was passed, uh, and the way the Congressional Budget Office scored it, it was 40 miles geodesic, uh, meaning as the crow flies. Uh, we have been given uh, enthusiastic support by both of our authorizing committees to take another look at that 40 mile um, uh, criteria. We're in the process of doing the review right now. We're gonna come back 
uh, to the Congress with a reinterpretation in an effort to open the aperture. We've had roughly a half a million calls to our, our call center about the Choice Act, uh, but only that's resulted in only about 30,000 appointments or so, and about half of those are because of 40 miles, about half of those are because of 30 days, the 30 day right. limit. That's just not a big enough take rate. So we're doing a better, we're trying to do a better job marketing. We're contacting veterans. We're also running the public service that I talked about. We want to see how far we can push it. At the same time, we want to as quickly as possible redefine that FOIA mile limit, which is the biggest barrier, and uh, and come back to to members of Congress with that reinterpretation. Okay, great. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I just add one thing, uh, Congresswoman? I just wanted to thank you for your commitment to and uh, persistent attention to the Central Alabama facility. So today, our top analytics team is visiting with them, both helping them understand their data, which I think has been a big, big change for us, this relentless focus on how we're doing, and also how to deploy tools that we've built so that they can identify some of the problems that occurred there at a much earlier stage. So just wanted you to know that. I'd like to recognize uh, uh, Ms. Lee at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you, Mr. Secretary, uh, Dr. Clancy, Secretary Hickey. Now, uh, I tell you, a couple of things uh, I have to preface this my, uh, question and statement with. First of all, I'm the daughter of a veteran. Uh, my dad died several years ago, so as, as the daughter of a veteran, I know the VA system as uh, very personally. And I just want to say to the three of you that I think you've made a lot of progress since um, I've had to deal with the VA on a personal basis, but not enough yet. And I have a lot of concerns, very grave concerns, regarding the funds that have already been spent on updating our veterans' claims backlog. Uh, again, uh, and I think, uh, Secretary Hickey, we've met several times with the California delegation as it relates to the Oakland um, VA regional office, which is in my district. And uh, we've seen money appropriated to fix the backlog, uh, but it still remains, and veterans still, who deserve their benefits, they're still dying before they can receive their benefits. And I want to read to you just a brief excerpt from, now this was February 25th, 2014, just recently, CBS News Report. Okay, and I want to make sure that this is accurate or not, but uh, I hope it's not said, last week the VA in Inspector General confirmed that because of poor record keeping in Oakland, veterans did not receive benefits to which they may have been entitled. How many veterans is not known because thousands of records were missing when inspectors arrived? The VA declined CBS News repeated interview requests, but it did admit to widespread problems in the handling of claims, but blamed that on the transition from a mail-based system to the new electronic system. The VA said in a statement, electronic claims processing transformed mail management for compensation claims, greatly minimizing any risk of delays due to loss and misplaced mail. Now, there have been several whistleblowers, of course, um, out of Oakland. And in this report that CBS presented February 25th, there was one individual who said that um, the VA took the files, put them, told them to put them in a file and stuff them away. There were 13,000 veterans begging for help. When this employee raised her concerns, she said she was taken off the project, and then this past summer, they found a cart of these same claims and they were ignored again. Can you uh, explain this I would to love me? To is that. this accurate or not? And what is taking place with the Oakland VA uh, office in the backlog. So I don't know what station uh, Mr. Paul Harvey uh, used to talk about, but there is a much bigger rest of the story that I'd love to be able to present to you. First of all, the 13,184 uh, pieces of paper they found were duplicate copies of an informal claim. It isn't even a real claim yet. It's a duplicate copy of an informal claim. They were in an old process that used to be done in VBA long before I got here. Uh, they used to make copies of things to keep track of them. And so those were the 13,184 pieces of paper put in the drawer. Um, at the same time, those same 13,184 veterans came in with their formal, formal original claim. 
we worked those all as we were as they were coming in they were not set aside those 13,000 copies were sitting in a drawer the originals were being worked by the employees the hard-working employees in the Oakland Regional Office or as you well know because we've talked about this many other hard-working employees across the nation whom we brokered out or sent out that work so no no veteran was waiting on those 13,184 while they were sitting in a drawer that was a copy second thing I would share with you is uh, we did not misplace any of those 13,184 uh, they were in that drawer we brought in we actually by the way discovered because I sent in a help team to help Oakland uh, and when we found them uh, the employee did exactly the right thing raised the issue and said there's 13,184 in there we need to do something they told us about it I called the IG and said full transparency I want you to get in there and make sure what's going on with those 13,184 and they did uh, we set up special teams that took every one of those copies against the, the original file that we worked we had already worked and we matched every single one twice a full 100% review of every single one against those copies of those informal claims to make sure we had it right. At the end of the day, we completed those two complete looks last September on the 5th of September, and we found in the process of reviewing, there were about 403 to be exact, where we said, you know what, we probably could have made a better decision on those 403 claims than we did when we worked them, and so we made some adjustments. All of them are complete none were missing no malfeasance in that whole effort no intention to hide anything we just had those 13,000 copies over there that practice has been discontinued that practice was not a practice by the new director who is out there who's doing a terrific job and today Oakland by the way is, uh, backlog is down 70 percent from when we were visiting when it was so bad in uh, that same 2012 2013 time frame they are doing much better their quality is up substantial all the investments you helped us do to make them better are seeing uh, good fruit I appreciate that but then maybe you need to call CBS and clarify this because this report is all over the place because also in it uh, it indicates that the VA the inspector general mind you confirmed that because of poor record-keeping in Oakland veterans did not receive benefits to which they had been entitled and this is the IG's quote and so you need to clarify that I think because uh, if in fact that's not the case you know we need to know that so I don't IG <laughs> needs to know that I think the IG uh, has worked very hard on this and I really appreciate their effort they're looking at lots of things with us right now um, and, uh, and I think their point is well taken as you well know we weren't doing a very good records keeping job during that whole time where we were not in great shape in Oakland and I think that's exactly what they're pointing out to us and the fact that we had a drawer of copies is still inappropriate and not good record keeping we have resolved that we have fixed that so I think in this case the IG was right we shouldn't have had those copies just sitting out there in a drawer somewhere we should have properly uh, disposed of them when we were complete with the claim so do we know how many veterans should have been uh, should have received their benefits that did not receive their benefits they, because they, of this uh, of the 13,184 um, all of them got their claims worked as we received them when we did the reviews we found about 400 where we went you know we could have made a better decision that's there the 400 you're right. that's okay. the 400 I'm talking about okay. Thank you they much. had received a decision already and they had received benefits already we were able to up their benefits okay thank you mr. chairman thank you. Mr. Fort Mary. thank you mr. chairman Mr. secretary good morning welcome uh, thank you all for your testimony this morning I, I think it should point out in light of all of the challenges and difficulties you're facing Nebraska by certain measures has had one of the best outcomes for service to veterans particularly in terms of the measure of process time uh, of processing claims uh, I think we were one of the states that actually took on additional caseload when other systems were under such severe stress. So I'm proud of that. It doesn't diminish, though, the need, obviously, to continue to work aggressively across the nation. But to the degree that we've served as a valuable template of service delivery, we're, we're happy to be in that position. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I really do appreciate your freshness of approach. 
and your creative commitment to trying to rethink some of the architecture in order to get us all to the goal that we share, the highest and best quality of care for our veterans. Uh, in that regard, I want to bring up a specific example from home. Uh, Omaha has a difficulty with our hospital, as you're quite aware. Uh, over the years, based upon a priority list, which is not necessarily the list of funding priorities, but is listed as a priority, which is, to me, a peculiarity. Nonetheless, it's floated from 30 down now to 10, 19, all over the place. Uh, the broader point being to maybe that's based on analytics, maybe that's based on more subjective criteria, I just don't know. The broader point, though, is enhanced strategic partnerships are the way forward. It is the model for the 21st century of veterans' care. If, as, as you are, have been invited, and as I, I know you are working to um, uh, commit to coming to Omaha, when you do, uh, you will be warmly received by uh, creative community partners who are ready and capable to think about, again, an enhanced strategy that looks at a new model by which we can build out a potential new facility if that's what's necessarily decided upon, as long as we have the flexibility for creative financing, or using existing structures that could be rehabilitated, or partnering with the excellent medical facilities through the University of Nebraska Med Center, Creighton Med Center, and other private facilities that are already there. Uh, a quick uh, anecdote, I've had uh, the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars in my office this week. And the committee has heard me talk about something, and you have as well, called the Veteran Certified Facility. And what I think this does is give us the ability to carry forward this important legacy of having the VA in charge of veterans' health care, but maybe embedding that within other systems, as long as we have oversight authority over it so that quality of care is delivered. But it gets us out of this problem of putting money under the mattress for years, sometimes decades at a time, in order to build out a facility, because we simply have been doing it that way for the last 100 years. The next 100 years, though, we can take that money that we do have, leverage it in strategic partnerships, and assure the veteran is getting the highest possible care, still while being under our authority. That's the new model and new way forward. I willingly commit our community to be your model template in this regard. I think, uh, I don't think that's an overextension of the desires of the community that I represent, uh, but I'd like to work with you as, whether it means new legislative authority or exercising the current authorities you have for creating and enhancing those strategic partnerships and labeling some, something like a veteran certified facility. I'd like you to respond to that, please. Well, we, we uh, agree with your, your comments. In fact, uh, uh, of the five objectives of my VA, uh, I think maybe perhaps one of the biggest ideas, other than being veteran-centric, is strategic partnerships. Uh, we are working very hard to establish strategic partnerships. And when I say that, I include, um, and I include the community. And I, I would just point to the example of um, we have a problem with homelessness. We're trying to drive down homelessness to zero, uh, virtual homelessness of veterans to zero by the end of this calendar year, yet we've had a lawsuit going on in Los Angeles uh, for four years uh, that, pre that stopped us from doing what we needed to do to use 380 acres that we had there uh, for homeless veterans. Um, I got involved uh, through a friend in Omaha. I found out who, the loss who was behind the lawsuit. We brought the community together, including the mayor and, and everyone else, uh, members of Congress, and we've come up with a solution and a memorandum of understanding and a plan forward to eliminate homelessness. So I, I want to do the same thing in Omaha. Perfect. Mr. Secretary, we need to get out of this trap of this priority list, which has, again, a model invented a long time ago, but is not enhancing the opportunity to leverage the strategic partners and actually get the services veterans need, need in a quicker fashion. We, we've, we've got to eliminate this, this construct because we're just carrying forward, as Sam Farr was saying earlier, we carry forward in time legacy systems and the Appropriations Committee gets trapped into whether or not we're going to plus up the same system or cut it back, rather than creating new architecture that actually makes sense in terms of service delivery. Does that mean my time's up? I, I didn't realize I talked that long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and you did.
<laughs> and, uh, uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I apologize for being late. And uh, you just answered some of the questions the, while listening to this discourse of other questions that were asked. But I would like to follow up on and the distinguished gentleman from Florida, uh, Mr. Rooney's question about bringing your business experience to the VA. What can Congress do to help you? Uh, I think the biggest thing Congress could do is, is provide me the flexibility the business leader has to get the job done. Let's agree on what the task is, and then let's have the flexibility to get it done. Uh, budget line items uh, where money can't be moved in a free market economy where we're, you know, arguably the VA is the largest business in government. We're the second largest department in government. We're the largest health care system in government. At one time, and this goes back to uh, the Congressman's recent comment, many of the things that we do are archaic versus today. Today, veterans have choice. They never had choice before. Yet our laws and our budgetary processes are all about an inflexible system, an inside system. So no criticism here. I just think we need to move forward and move toward uh, the end game, which is going to be strategic partnerships. It's going to be a combination of inside VA care and outside care. But we have to have the budget to do that. We have to have the flexibility to do that. And all of us focus on the task of providing the care for benefit to veterans. And I appreciate that. And following up on as uh, questions, too, it would seem to me from my visits that we have legacy systems that are putting Band-Aids on systems from the 70s when this room used to be the size of the server, where now it's so much smaller and different. Would it make more sense to start a system that's 2017 and start working towards that one and eventually discard the legacy system? Wouldn't there be some cost benefit to that? One of, one, that's a great point. One of the things that we're doing, and this is particularly true of the health system, because I think, as you've heard from uh, Allison's comments about the benefit system, um, she and her team have done a great job uh, bringing it, modernizing it, digitizing it, and getting it uh, going. I, admittedly, we have more work to do yet, but we're on the way. In the healthcare system, uh, we've got uh, more fundamental work to do. Um, under Alice, under uh, Carolyn's leadership, uh, we put together something called the Blueprint for Excellence, which is a 10 strategy plan of returning the healthcare system to uh, preeminence uh, in the country. Um, that plan talks about strategic partnerships. It talks about a hybrid system. That's the vision that we have. As we continue to work, we will get uh, more and more uh, concrete on what that vision looks like. And I think that your point's exactly right. Rather than trying to take a, an operating room, which needs to be 50% 50, 50 bigger, and trying to do that, maybe we go use an operating room in a university that we have an affiliation with. Uh, we've got great affiliations with, um, with the best medical schools in the country. So there's a lot that can be done. And we're going to be making that vision more and more concrete over time. And I wish we would continue to advocate on those ways we can help you get to where you need to go because uh, it's important and uh, Madam Undersecretary you brought up that you have a strong Irish voice keep it up I mean you, you it, one thing I, I know the frustration is 25 years as a DA and then you get to this land and, and it, it operates completely different and, and you wonder where you are sometimes but there's ways to streamline the process and it seems sometimes especially in this one the frustrating thing is because it was done this way or because of the antiquated system we're in and that's just not acceptable. And the other thing that uh, you had answered it in the last question too, but uh, in as DAs, and I know with friends uh, who are doing the same thing, I tell you, it breaks your heart when you have to exercise prosecutor, prosecutorial discretion because veterans do something so that they can get put in a place where they can get three squares and a roof over their head. And it's wrong in that you address that, and I know you've got many programs, but whatever we can do to make sure not one veteran is homeless, is uh, anything we can do to help you in that, please be loud, be clear, and let us help you get that account. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, incarceration for a veteran is a ticket to homelessness. And so veterans courts, uh, it was mentioned earlier in, in one of the uh, members' testimony, veterans courts are a great way to deal with this. We're big advocates of veterans courts. We support veterans courts. Um, I spoke at the Harvard Business, uh, Harvard Law School about veterans courts. We want to do everything we can to put veterans courts in place in every state because if we can keep veterans out of jail, 
we'll keep them out of being homeless. It's a great point. Great. Thank you very much for your time here today. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for respecting the time limits, Mr. Joyce. Appreciate it. That ends round one of the. Uh, that ends round one of the uh, questioning. We'll move into the round two, and uh, and I know I'd like to try to conclude this uh, hearing by, by by lunchtime, by noon. So, um, Mr. Secretary, uh, following up on Mr. Bishop's comments and also the full chairman, Mr. Rogers, about the interoperability of health records, um, you, you obviously you haven't been you, you haven't been here for the frustrating experience of watching DoD and VA agree to develop a single uh, integrated health record, then spend years and hundreds of millions of dollars on it, only to throw in the towel and go down the you go down two separate tracks. Uh, DOD will soon uh, award a contract for the new electronic health record, and VA is working to modernize its existing uh, uh, VISTA health record. Both departments assert they're committed to making their two records interoperable uh, with the other and, and uh, with the private providers that, uh, that both active service members and veterans uh, would use. Uh, I also want you to know that members of the House Appropriations Committee were strongly in favor of the integrated health record and we're determined that the, the two records be interoperable, and we just want to, again, hear your assurances that this is going to happen. Uh, and uh, moreover, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the money side of this. Uh, Congress provided $344 million for the VA electronic <coughs> health record for fiscal year 15, and despite all the increases elsewhere in, in the budget, uh, you're requesting $100 million, $111 million less uh, uh, than for 2016. You indicate that less funding is required uh, because the transition from moving from a single to, uh, to two interoperable records took longer than anticipated, leaving carryover uh, in addition to uh, uh, the uh, 2015 funds, and that, le and that less uh, 2016 funding better aligns uh, program requirements uh, with workload capacity. Uh, the committee certainly doesn't want to provide you with funding you, you cannot use, uh, but what does that say about your progress in moder modernizing VISTA? Will you still meet your deadline of reaching uh, final operating capability for this evolution by 2018? We are, we are totally committed to um, maintaining and making modern and useful our electronic health record. This has become even more important than it was before because, as Steph alluded to earlier, we now have private sector doctors using our record. I went to the American Medical Association convention last summer in Dallas and I talked a lot about how do I get every doctor in this country using our health record. Our record is open source, which means it's free. Our record is uh, crowdsourced innovation, which means if a doctor uses our record and has an idea to improve it, we want that idea. I think there's a, a real opportunity here to make our record the world-class record uh, it can be. And uh, so it needs to go forward to the private sector doctor and backward to the DOD. So that interoperability is actually essential in both directions. Sir, to your question about the, the decrement in 2016 and the request, um, it, it did take us longer when we moved from how we were doing a single record together into how we are going to go forward. Uh, recognizing the sharing of information with third-party providers. So instead of asking for dollars in 16 that we could not spend, uh, we felt it was more appropriate to basically work off uh, the, fo the funds we carried over in 14, uh, the resources we received in 15, and that's why there was a reduction in 16. Uh, we are still on track to make the interoperability commitments. In fact, uh, that sharing of information, and, and again, Janice is just one piece of it, uh, on track to meet that. Um, and you'll, you'll see a robust request for 17 and 18 as we pick back up uh, the effort. Uh, again, work through the transition, uh, reduction in 16 because we could not spend those resources, and in 17 you'll see a robust request coming in. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Secretary, too, the, uh, the recent Academy o the Award given to the documentary uh, profiling the uh, VA crisis hotline brought a fresh public spotlight on the, uh, the tragic problem of uh, suicide and mental illness, behavioral health <laughs> among veterans that the uh, VA has been battling for many years. Uh, in response to the problem over the years, the VA has in increased its number of mental health uh, practitioners, uh, incorporated mental health services into uh, primary care to reduce stigma, uh, conducted research on effective treatments for service-related uh, mental health issues, and supported numerous outreach and uh, prevention campaigns. Uh, can you tell us uh, what additional steps the VA plans 
uh, to take the battle of suicide and serious mental illness uh, within the, the veteran population. I know that you plan to hire more than, uh, I guess, 2,100 mental health staff through the CHOICE Act uh, funding by the end of uh, uh, 2016, as an example. The, uh, the Clay Hunt Act was also helpful, and we're very thankful uh, to uh, members of Congress for the Clay Hunt Act because, as Carolyn said earlier, um, re being able to repay student loans is, is uh, an incentive to get more mental health professionals, and that allowed for a $30,000 uh, repayment of student loans. It also allowed for uh, more residencies, as I recall, uh, and residencies becomes an issue. Um, medical schools will tell you they can, they can produce more graduates, but without the residencies, it, it doesn't help. So that, that's very helpful. Um, to me, the biggest thing we've got to do is outreach. Uh, we've got to find the veterans uh, who are, for whatever reason, resistant to seeking that care. And I'm very hopeful that with the American Sniper being such a successful movie, and with our um, uh, Academy Award that we won for our Dial One um, documentary, that this is going to create more um, visibility in the general public and help uh, Americans realize that if they see some a veteran uh, who may need help, to let somebody know about it. We have a toll-free number that can be called, and, uh, and we want to increase our outreach, uh, both from veterans and from the general public and from family members, so we can get in touch with these individuals. Because we know if we get them, and we get them into our system, that we can effectively treat them. So one other point I would just make, Mr. Chairman, um, we take every suicide very, very seriously and almost personally. And in fact, we do what we call a behavioral health autopsy. That is to say, each case gets a very in-depth review, and the team has put together a database. What they are doing now is trying to identify how we might use all of the data from our electronic health records and other sources to identify those at highest risk and target the outreach that the Secretary just mentioned. Uh, we think that there are going to be some early signals that we can be able to do that. Um, it is a very, very difficult challenge, but one that we are not letting up on. Uh, very, very quickly, just to quickly go back to the CHOICE Act, Mr. Secretary. You're, you're no doubt aware that the uh, initial report on the, on the CHOICE program that the, that the VFW organization uh, released yesterday, uh, the, uh, the group surveyed their membership to judge how many, qualify, how many uh, qualified and were able to use CHOICE. Uh, although the VFW report uh, acknowledges that uh, the VA didn't have much time to get the program running at the VA, has been working hard to improve it. The results uh, the report, that, that they reported were disappointing. Uh, the UFW says that only 20 percent of veterans uh, who live uh, more than 40 miles uh, from the nearest facility or who had to wait uh, more than 30 days uh, for an appointment were offered the choice option. Almost all those surveyed who were not offered choice said they were interested in obtaining non-VA care. Uh, don't the VA findings, uh, uh, I, I guess, contradict your statements that uh, not many veterans seem to be interested in using choice to obtain non-VA care. In my sense, is many are very interested, just simply not eligible. No, as I said, uh, we would like to do more with the choice program. Uh, and we want to make sure every eligible veteran is able to take advantage of it. Um, I appreciate the VFW running that research. Uh, we sent out cards starting in November. The last cards went out in January. That research started in December. So. Um, and, and was completed recently. So it's going to take time, but we're redoubling our efforts, as I said earlier, to make sure every veteran knows of their um, qualifications for the CHOICE program and every veteran can take advantage of it. We appreciate the VFW running the research. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll yield to Mr. Uh, at this time, I recognize. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to turn to some parochial issues. Um, I've heard that some VA hospitals are looking at converting their energy supply uh, to gas from electricity. And I understand that the Atlanta VA is studying a possible conversion. Uh, apparently, any type of conversion could cost uh, a significant amount of money uh, in capital costs. Uh, what is the thought process and analysis uh, of this decision? I'm not aware of that specific um, uh, situation, Ranking Member Bishop, but I know from my private sector experience, I have converted different plants from, uh, from gas to 
from natural gas to electricity and, and back and forth or use cogeneration. So I'm assuming that the study would have to show a rate of return on that investment if we're going to make the capital investment. I can assure you that um, as the secretary, I would not uh, make that investment if there weren't an acceptable rate of return for the American people. But we'll have to dig into that specific example. Thank you. Uh, during, during our last conversation, you mentioned that there has been uh, 18,000 square feet of space at Martin Army uh, Community Hospital uh, that would be allocated for the VA clinic, for a VA clinic. Well, that was to be an initial allocation, as I understand it, of 10,000 square feet, followed by 8,000 square feet a, a month later. Uh, as you know, this is something that I've been asking for for years, the co-location uh, with DOD and VA of, of uh, clinics. Uh, can you provide me an update uh, as to the status of the transition? Um, that's as much as I know is what you just said. We're in the process of making the transition. And again, I think this is a, um, a good example of another strategic partnership. And that's a partnership with DOD. And we appreciate your comments and the fact that you've been looking for this. Uh, Carolyn, I don't know if you have an update beyond that. I understand that it's all on track. And uh, there will be sort of a grand opening in May. But you better believe we'll be letting you know about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, um, uh, we talked at length about the selection of a VA clinic in North Columbus, Georgia, uh, and the questions of the process uh, utilized in the selection of the, of the site. Uh, have you been able to find out anything in regards to the property selection there and uh, if it's truly the best location that will service uh, the veterans in the uh, Columbus, Georgia, Phoenix, Alabama, uh, and surrounding areas? We did look into that. After we talked, we did look into that process. And um, frankly, I think that we could have done a better job uh, involving uh, your staff and you uh, in that process of, of sec selecting that location. Uh, the location is selected. We do think it's a good location. And uh, if we were to change the location, my understanding is it would significantly delay us. Uh, and as a result, we think it's best to move forward. But we do think that the process could have been improved of, um, of including your staff and you uh, in, in the process better. It's my understanding that there's no public transportation that will go to that site uh, and that uh, there are very few veterans that actually live in that area, uh, that the central uh, city location would uh, provide much greater access uh, with uh, public transportation. Uh, and that there are facilities uh, there that are already constructed uh, as a part of the uh, Columbus Regional Medical uh, uh, Complex. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand how they came to the, process, the, the conclusion that, uh, that that was uh, uh, the best location. I believe that transportation is going to be arranged for those veterans who would <clears> need um, transportation from, uh, particularly if they're at that other complex and need to get out to our facility. I believe that there was a problem with putting this facility downtown, but I will follow up with you on that yeah, directly. Yes. yes the, yeah, I, I don't know what the problem was other than that the, uh, the specifications when they put the request uh, for a proposal out uh, excluded uh, that particular uh, geography where there was a, a tremendous uh, medical complex in existence that had excess space and was already wired for uh, all kinds of uh, emergency uh, transportation, for um, specialty services and the like. Mr. Jolly, recognize Mr. Jolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have one question I didn't get to last time. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you made a, a very reasonable uh, argument and request that uh, regarding vacant facilities. And one of the ways we could be helpful would be to remove the obstacles uh, that stand in your way of closing facilities. What are those obstacles on the congressional side? Are they merely political? Are they statutory? Are they tied to funding? I'll have to get back to you on the details. My understanding is they're, they're generally um, political, 
And um, I don't know who would stand by that that one facility that you sent a picture of. I think yes, we should be able to that, close that, that one, right? That garage. <laughs> we 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 obviously picked that picture on purpose. <laughs> right. Helen, do you have any? Uh, what 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 do we need uh, help on here? Is it statutory or? Thank you for asking. Sure. So it's a com combination of different things. We do have facilities such as that one that is designated as a historical facility, which once that happens, we're not able to move forward. And then it is a lot of political concern when we look to close a facility. So we need something like a BRAC process that would be fair that a board would evaluate our facilities and Congress would agree with those closures based on their ranking. So, but do you have the authority, and let's just, let's stick with vacant facilities, not, you know, reducing the footprint of maybe existing facilities, but your vacant facilities, do you have the authority to close them? And I ask just because if it is political, then the category of vacant facilities, I think would be the low hanging fruit with the least amount of political opposition. Do you have the legal authority to close vacant facilities? So each case tends to be a little bit different. Sometimes that facility is on a complex and what we don't have enough construction money to tear it down. And often when we start to do that process, one of the historical uh, organizations gets involved um, so yes, we would probably need an agreement that everybody was going to agree sure. to close certain facilities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can we submit that question for the record on what your authorities are? <laughs> that would be helpful. Thank you. Recognize Mr. Portmary. Uh, this was related to the line of questioning I wanted to undertake. But first of all, let me make a quick recommendation. It, if there is some viable mechanism whereby you can creatively dispose of excess inventory and capacity working with communities, do not call it BRAC. Do, do, don't do that. Because this is a positive thing. We are trying to make you more efficient and effective, not close stuff in communities. And that means transitioning, whether it's vacant property or underutilized property. By the way, the VA clinic in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I live, has a similar dilemma. A very old, stately facility that needs to be preserved, enhanced and preserved, and there's development agreements that have tried to be worked, and it is completely stuck. In the meanwhile, what is happening? The VA is carrying SS capacity, taking money away from your primary mission, the community is not being as well served because there are other development opportunities there, and we're losing the opportunity to rehabilitate and preserve historic structures. So I'll think of, I'll come up with an acronym if you want, but don't uh, say BRAC. Sorry, we have um, a legislative request that we have submitted to give us enhanced use lease authority. Right now, our authority is limited to only supportive housing for homeless veterans. We would like to expand that back to the authority we used to have so we could bring in a broader range of people to use those beautiful historical well, did, facilities. Well, perhaps, Mr. Secretary, this is the heart of the problem that we've all been talking around with our lofty ideals of strategic partnerships. The mechanism for this, one of them anyway, the creative financing mechanism, could be this enhanced leasing authority where you private build, lease back, or wh however you want to structure it. You said it, we used to have the authority, you no longer do. What happened? I think part of it was around uh, the issues in Los Angeles that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Los Angeles campus had a rental car facility, uh, a laundry facility, and a whole bunch of other things. And as a result of that, um, the enhanced use lease authority got, got restricted. Uh, I think we're beyond that now. We've solved the problem in Los Angeles, so this would be helpful. The other thing that would be helpful, and we've done a lot of study on this, is with the strategic partnerships, we also have the ability to create mechanisms where we could receive funds from the private sector to help veterans. And we've looked at that authority as well. Well, I think what would be helpful, and you alluded to this earlier, is if we can quantify 
what you need in in the, uh, across the multiple platforms of what we've talked about in terms of enhanced authority that is going to give us creative opportunity to have the private sector either contribute or be involved in the financing so we can just get going here. There's no reason for all of this holdup. It's just that we're carrying legacy infrastructure of previous ideas as to how to do things. It's not a condemnation of the past. We had to do it that way. But we don't have to do it that way going forward. So I think as, a, as, a, as an outcome here, a tangible outcome, can you get back to us with the list after the evaluation is done of what specific legislative authorities you need, or if it's a matter of just cross-agency communication, as we talked about with the OMB, right. who has some stress regarding enhanced leases or, or, or private bill with lease back arrangements, that would be very helpful. And we'll if we do could that. do that quickly, that would be helpful. We'll do that. We'll do it very soon. Great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And that concludes the second round. But before we depart, I just want to ask one quick question. I'm going to submit the balance of my, my questions for the, uh, for the record. Um, your predecessor, uh, Secretary, set goals uh, of ending the disability claims backlog uh, defined as uh, taking longer than 125 days uh, per, cl uh, per claim and achieving a 98 percent accuracy in claims by the end of 2015. Uh, your budget document uh, assert that you will meet the timeliness standard, although outside observers are a little bit more skeptical. It appears that the trend in backlog reduction has declined in the last eight months. Um, your budget documents are silent about whether you will be able to meet the 98 percent accuracy goal by the end of the year. Uh, why does that goal prove a bit more elusive to you? And uh, what steps, you know, training, enhanced review, et cetera, are, uh, are necessary to achieve a quality goal? On that particular goal, we've done a, a, a deep dive on the statistics of that goal. And um, statistically, it would be virtually, it's virtually impossible to achieve it. Um, statistically, if you have two probabilities, let's say one is 0.5 percent, the other is 0.5 percent, together they're 0.25 percent. If you add another one, you know, and, and, and the probability keeps going down the more elements you add. Uh, we did a deep dive on this, and there's so many elements to achieving a perfect uh, claim res resolution that it would be impossible to get to 98 percent. Um, Allison, any detail you want to add? The only thing else I would add is that I have met now repeatedly with uh, commercial industry uh, experts and chief claims officers from across the nation who do similar-like work. And when I describe to them the level of quality we have already attained, um, uh, and then I say to them, how would you get further? They say to me the return on investment would be so huge to get further that they actually believe, and when I ask them about their numbers, I'm actually ahead of most of them in terms of the quality that they do. They didn't say just have a process on the backside for which uh, a working appeals process with good law around it, have a process on the backside for which you address those points of disagreement. I think it's important to also note there is no correlation today between quality and appeal. We've done that study and that analysis. In fact, some of our best stations have the highest number of appeals. Um, so, so what I would tell you is uh, we are really optimizing the system right now at that 96 percent medical issue quality, which by the way is of five and a half million issues we have done this year. Um, uh, and we'll go up again next year. So we are actually doing pretty well against that at the individual medical issue level. We have, and I thank you for the resources, significantly improved our training programs, our challenge programs, and we even have sort of remediation now programs that you've assisted us with. We also have consistency studies we're doing every day. We have quality review team people in the regional office who are providing just-in-time assessment of errors. We have almost seven or eight layers of quality assurance now uh, that I would actually say uh, probably supersedes what even industry does uh, in this area. Thank you. And, uh, Bishop? Mm -hmm. Okay. With that, uh, this concludes our hearing. I want to thank all of you today, uh, Secretary and staff, for your, your, and this, this uh, hearing is adjourned.